Mr. Hoover, I asked you to pursue a real threat. Instead, you have publicly denied the existence of organized crime and now this, this gross display of intimidation. Mr. Attorney General, I was only following orders. We, we bugged the basement of a home in Los Angeles that was a known gathering place for lawbreakers. How was I to know that an East German communist would be down there having sex with your brother, the President of the United States? Do not shoot the messenger, sir. I am, I am here to protect you both. Remember that. What do you want from me? If this information were to go public, it would create widespread distrust in your brother's leadership capabilities. And above all else, I hold the well-being of our country paramount. So how may I help you, Mr. Hoover? Well, the concept of organized crime began to enter the American consciousness in the 40s and 50s. During this time, however, the attention of the nation was largely focused on more pressing global events, such as World War II and the rise of communism. These issues dominated media coverage, overshadowing the activities of organized crime groups. Despite this, the era of the Great Depression saw the emergence of a new form of organized crime characterized by bank robbers and gangsters, who came to be seen by some as modern-day Robin Hoods. Amidst widespread economic hardship, these figures were often romanticized for their defiance against banks, which were perceived to have exploited the common people. Interestingly, prominent members of the Mafia, such as Charlie Luciano, Mayor Lansky, Frank Costello, and Carlos Marcello, had a particular fondness for bank robbers, viewing them with a certain admiration. This affinity was rooted in their own criminal beginnings, with many of them involved in bank robberies themselves during the late 1910s. Their early exploits laid a foundation for their eventual rise in the world of organized crime. As a result, news of bank robberies captivated not only the general public, but also these influential mob bosses, highlighting the complex relationship between the public perception of these criminals and their actual deeds. During the late 20s and early 30s, the United States witnessed the rise of several notorious bank robbers. This period, often referred to as the public enemy era, saw a surge in high-profile bank robberies, often carried out by individuals or gangs who became legendary figures. Some in today's world have movies made about them, such as John Dillinger. Perhaps the most infamous of all, Dillinger was known for his daring bank robberies and escapes from law enforcement. His exploits captured the public's imagination during the Great Depression. Charles Arthur, Pretty Boy Floyd, Known for his elusive tactics, with the law, earned a folk hero status to some by targeting mortgage documents during his bank heists. This act of destroying mortgage papers not only endangered his life, but also played a pivotal role in casting him in a positive light among the public. It was speculated that those who benefited from his actions might have been the ones encouraging him, viewing Floyd as merely seizing an opportunity. Yet, Floyd was aware that eliminating these documents would garner public respect, making it easier for him to blend in and hide among the very people he helped. Babyface Nelson Lester Joseph Gillis, better known by his alias Babyface Nelson, was notorious for his violent tendencies and was a key associate of John Dillinger. George Machine Gun Kelly is another well-known figure from this era, earning his nickname from his weapon of choice. He was involved in numerous crimes, including bank robbery. Alvin Carpis, often known as Creepy for his sinister smile, was a leader of the Barker Carpis gang, responsible for a string of bank robberies and kidnappings. Bonnie and Clyde were a notorious couple who became infamous during the Great Depression. They were well known for their dangerous criminal activities across Central America, often accompanied by their gang. Their love story added a unique twist to their criminal exploits, as they were deeply in love and willing to face death together. To effectively end their reign of terror, authorities knew they had to capture or kill both, since leaving one alive would only lead to efforts to free the other. Their actions not only captured the public's attention, who at the time held deep resentment towards banks and Wall Street, but also embarrassed the famous J. Edgar Hoover. Multiple movies have been made about Bonnie and Clyde, 
showcasing the significant impact they had on American history. Their exploits captured the attention of the American press and its readership during what is occasionally referred to as the public enemy era between 1931 and 1934. They were ambushed by police and shot to death in Bienville Parish, Louisiana. They are believed to have murdered at least nine police officers and four civilians. During the public enemy era, when bank robberies were rampant and attacks on the banking system frequent, J. Edgar Hoover emerged as a key figure. He was tasked with transforming the FBI into a formidable force against gangsters like Bonnie and Clyde, symbolizing America's fight for law and order. However, Hoover's efforts to capture the infamous duo were met with constant failure. Dressed in sharp suits and distinctive hats, his agents were easy to spot in Middle America, where they searched for Bonnie and Clyde. Their presence only fueled resentment towards Washington and the FBI, as locals refused to cooperate with the federal agents. Hoover's approach was criticized as ineffective, with his agents often seen as inexperienced and unable to outmaneuver the criminal couple. This led to a series of embarrassments for the FBI, damaging Hoover's reputation and undermining public confidence in the agency. Despite the significant resources deployed, the FBI's efforts only resulted in showcasing the aftermath of Bonnie and Clyde's crimes, leaving states to turn to local law enforcement for help. The breakthrough came not from the FBI, but from Texas Ranger Frank Hamer, who led the 1934 posse that ultimately killed Bonnie and Clyde. Hamer's success, based on local knowledge and connections, including insights from local criminals, overshadowed the FBI's efforts. This episode highlighted the limitations of the FBI under Hoover's leadership and the effectiveness of traditional law enforcement methods. It was Hamer and the Texas Rangers who received public acclaim, leaving Hoover and the FBI to reflect on their strategies and the importance of local expertise in law enforcement. J. Edgar Hoover navigated a complex landscape marked by conflict and alliances with organized crime. Unlike his confrontations with notorious gangsters like Dutch Schultz, Hoover found the Italian Mafia, led by figures such as Lucky Luciano, to be a formidable opponent. Luciano's strategic move to eliminate Schultz and Hoover's subsequent decision to imprison Lepke in the 40s highlight the intricate power dynamics of the time. Hoover recognized the limitations of direct confrontation with organized crime, especially given the Mafia's influence over political circles. The need for FBI funding and expanded surveillance capabilities led Hoover to a pragmatic approach. He understood that working with figures like Frank Costello, who wielded considerable power in Congress, was essential. Costello's grip on political strings meant that any attempt to bolster the FBI's resources would be futile without his tacit approval. This realization prompted Hoover to engage in a strategic quid pro quo with key underworld figures. By exchanging favors and information, Hoover aimed to secure the support necessary for the FBI's empowerment. His efforts extended beyond mere law enforcement. Hoover sought to establish himself as a powerful, influential figure within the American elite. Hoover's ambition transcended the mere pursuit of criminals. It was about crafting a legacy of power, influence and control. His desire to be perceived as a relentless, effective leader by the American public was as much about personal legacy as it was about law enforcement. Through strategic alliances and political maneuvering, Hoover aimed to cement his place in history as the indomitable head of the FBI. Frank Costello's rise in organized crime brought significant political influence, making allies of senators, judges and politicians. His abilities caught J. Edgar Hoover's eye, leading to a notable alliance during the 40s, while Hoover pursued mobster Lepke, a key figure in Luciano's criminal empire with control over unions and illegal rackets. As prosecutors, led by Tom Dewey, intensified their hunt for Lepke, he evaded capture by going into hiding, prompting a nationwide manhunt. Hoover, with Luciano imprisoned, approached individuals close to Lepke, including Costello, Lansky, and Luciano himself, seeking their cooperation. 
Luciano sanctioned Costello to assist Hoover, aiming to enhance Hoover's law enforcement reputation. A secret deal was struck between Costello and Hoover, facilitated by journalist Walter Winchell, leading to Lepka's peaceful surrender to the FBI. However, Lepka felt betrayed upon realizing there was no escape from his fate in prison, culminating in his execution by electric chair. This event marked the beginning of a covert partnership between the Italian Mafia and the FBI. Hoover and Costello would meet to exchange information, not only on gambling, but also to navigate the intertwined worlds of politics and organized crime. Hoover acknowledged the utility of figures like Costello, tolerating their activities as long as they contributed to national interests. The secret alliance eventually came to light, shocking the political sphere. In the 60s, insiders revealed the Mafia-FBI connection to John F. Kennedy, sending shockwaves through his administration. Following Hoover's death, the story was confirmed to Time magazine in 1977, showcasing the complex relationships between crime, law enforcement, and politics. In the 40s, organized crime deeply infiltrated various levels of the U.S. government, exerting control over influential figures including senators, public officials, and even the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. This widespread corruption reached into law enforcement, with some police officers, including highly decorated ones, becoming complicit in mafia activities. These officers, some holding significant ranks, could obtain sensitive information, further aiding the operations of organized crime groups. The reason these men became unstoppable was because nothing was able to stop them. New York's corruption, particularly under Costello's influence, was notable for its control over the police and street activities. However, Chicago was even more corrupt, serving as a prime location for major conventions alongside Atlantic City. This pattern of corruption extended beyond New York, notably in Dallas, where police were significantly influenced by the Southern Mafia, including the Campisi, and Carlos Marcello families. The spread of corruption across America resembled a pervasive plague. By the 50s, figures within organized crime had become virtually untouchable, their influence so entrenched that they formed a symbiotic relationship with key government agencies, including the CIA. This was not limited to the Italian Mafia, but extended to the French Corsican Mafia, the Jewish Mafia, and other criminal organizations. Together, they played a significant role in shaping the American empire, marking a complex period of collusion between the state and organized crime networks. I have previously discussed an article about J. Edgar Hoover on my YouTube channel. However, I have decided to revisit and refine this content for you, diving deeper into Hoover's legacy and the impact of his passing. I ensure the credibility and transparency of my content by relying on reputable sources like Time and Life magazines. The legend is crumbling. The squat bulldog features, set fiercely in tenacious pursuit of the ten most wanted criminals, the gangbuster nemesis of Babyface Nelson, John Dillinger, Ma Barker, the scourge of would-be spies and saboteurs, the alert sentinel and fearless fighter holding back the tide of the Red Menace, the stubbornly independent guardian of even-handed law enforcement, high-mindedly fending off congressmen and presidents who sought to use his agency for political purposes. J. Edgar Hoover deserved some of that billing, although it was overblown from the start. Now, just three years after his death, a sharply different portrait is emerging of the man who built the Federal Bureau of Investigation into the world's most reputable police organization through 48 years as its famed director. To be sure, there had always been a few blemishes some from scattered revelations through the decades, some from his own reckless conduct as he grew older and fought to retain the power he felt slipping away. But now, under congressional and journalistic scrutiny, as well as in the writings of his once fearful agents, a darker picture is coming into view. In these new shades, Hoover is seen as a shrewd bureaucratic genius who cared less about crime than about perpetuating his crime-busting image. With his acute public relations sense, 
he managed to obscure his bureau's failings while magnifying its sometimes successes. Even his fervent anti-communism has been cast into doubt. Some former aides insist that he knew the party was never a genuine internal threat to the nation, but a useful popular target to ensure financial and public support for the FBI. Even more serious flaws in the Hoover character and official performance have become known. Instead of insulating his bureau from politically sensitive presidents, Hoover eagerly complied with improper requests from the men in the White House for information on potential opponents. If a president failed to ask for such information, the director often volunteered it. He tapped the telephones of government officials on request, perused files of politicians unasked, volunteered titbits of gossip. He was a petty man of towering personal hates. There was more than a tinge of racism in his vicious vendetta against Martin Luther King Jr. He had to be pushed into hiring black agents for the Bureau. His informers, infiltrators and wiretappers delved into the activities of even the most innocuous and non-violent civil rights and anti-war groups, trampling on the rights of citizens to express grievances against their government. His spies, within potentially dangerous extremist groups, sometimes provoked more violence than they prevented. As an administrator, he was an erratic, unchallengeable czar, banishing agents to Siberian posts on whimsy, terrorizing them with torrents of implausible rules, insisting on conformity of thought as well as dress. The fact that such a man could acquire and keep that kind of power raises disturbing questions not merely about the role of a national police in a democracy, but also about the political system that tolerated him for so long. The revelations show, too, that those political dissidents in years past who complained they were being harassed and spied upon were not so paranoid. As the pendulum of public esteem swings away from the old Hoover reputation, the correction seems necessary, though it could also go too far. The director's defenders, at least, are outraged. When the lion dies, the rats come out, sneers Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., longtime star of the once top-rated television series The FBI, insists William Ruckelshaus, one of the victims of Richard Nixon's Saturday Night Massacre. Really, the man had only one motive. That was to make the FBI the finest investigative agency in the world, Edward Sorrell. Certainly the post-Watergate morality casts a harsher light on official conduct that once was not questioned. In the Cold War period, the communist threat from abroad, if not at home, did look and was dangerous. Such FBI infiltrated groups as the Ku Klux Klan, and whether Hoover's men did anything to stop any violence or they themselves actually made the situation worse. Throughout much of his career, Hoover used information compiled by his agents to build political support for the Bureau. Time has learned, for example, that Hoover went to one senator with the revelation that his daughter was using hard drugs. Hoover agreed to keep the matter quiet and thereby earned the senator's lasting gratitude. Similarly, when Hoover discovered that one congressman was a gay person, he visited the legislator to assure him that this news would never leak from the FBI and thus made a new friend for the Bureau. The director's dealings with presidents, as detailed two weeks ago by a Senate committee report, time December 15th, were just as self-serving. Clearly the worst offender in demanding political information from Hoover was President Lyndon Johnson. Both men loved gossip and this type of intrigue. Hoover ingratiated himself with LBJ during the Justice Department's investigation of Johnson's congressional protégé and crony, Bobby Baker, a man with known connections to Jimmy Hoffa, the Mafia, and was the man who received a phone call from Jack Ruby on the day of JFK assassination. Asked by Attorney General Robert Kennedy to wire someone to talk to a Baker friend, Hoover not only refused, but reported the request to Johnson. The Justice Department lawyers went to Treasury agents instead and got the help they sought. That infuriated Johnson, who asked Hoover to check out Treasury for the men who helped Kennedy. Always worried about Kennedy supporters in his midst, Johnson kept asking Hoover to investigate White House personnel. 
Time has learned that presidential speechwriter Richard Goodwin resigned as the result of one such probe. Johnson also ordered FBI name checks on high officials in the Democratic National Committee for the same purpose. LBJ was so phobic about the Kennedys that when the Washington Star attacked him editorially, he asked Hoover to find out if there was any Kennedy money behind the paper. Since the FBI also had its own enemies list of newspapers critical of Hoover, the director was sympathetic to such appeals moreover. When Johnson's aide, Walter Jenkins, participated in a gay episode in 1964, LBJ suspected that a Barry Goldwater supporter may have set up the arrest. He angrily ordered Hoover to seek derogatory material on Goldwater's Senate staff to be held for use if the senator made an issue of the Jenkins matter in the presidential campaign. Goldwater never did so. Johnson even directed Hoover to tap the phone Republican vice presidential candidate Spiro Agnew in 1968 on the vague suspicion that Agnew was sending word to the South Vietnamese that they would get a better peace arrangement through Nixon if he were elected president than through LBJ. Such practices dated back to Franklin Roosevelt, who sought FBI name checks on US isolationists in 1940, and began the practice of asking the FBI to wiretap some of his own top advisors, including Harry Hopkins and Tommy the Cork Corcoran. Truman, by contrast, wanted nothing to do directly with Hoover, who had to deal with the president's military ID, Brigadier General Harry Vaughan. When Vaughan showed Truman an FBI transcript of the tap on Corcoran, Truman was unimpressed. It was about Mrs. Corcoran making appointments with her hairdresser. Well, I don't give a goddamn whether Mrs. Corcoran gets her hair fixed or doesn't get her hair fixed. What is that crap? Vaughan tells Truman, it's a wiretap. Truman replies, cut them all off. Tell the FBI we haven't got any time for that kind of shit. Hoover seems to have had little more success in foisting political intelligence on D. White Eisenhower. Although Jack Kennedy and his brother Robert, as Attorney General, went along with some of the Hoover wiretapping, the brothers posed new difficulty for the director. For the first time, Hoover found it impossible to bypass the Attorney General. Matters were not helped when Hoover visited Bobby for the first time at the Justice Department and the shirt-sleeved young Attorney General threw darts throughout their conversation. The director was outraged at what he considered disrespect. Bobby, moreover, often missed the dartboard and ripped the wall. To Hoover this was a desecration of government property. Bobby was the only Attorney General who dared summon Hoover by buzzer to his office. Kennedy, in fact, ordered a direct line placed in the director's office after discovering that this phone had been moved to the desk of Helen Gandhi, Hoover's secretary. Out of fear, or respect, or both, many associates of Hoover have long refused to discuss publicly the personal side of the director's life. Even now his posthumous grip is so firm in the minds of many that details of it are scarce. Yet some are dribbling out. The man's ample ego, for example, was shown he furnished his $160,000 home a red brick house in Washington's Rock Creek Park. The foyer always greeted visitors with a photo of Hoover chatting with the incumbent president. A large portrait of Hoover graced the first landing of the stairs toward the second floor. A bronze bust of him stood for years at the top of the stairs. All four walls of the lower recreation room were papered with pictures of Hoover with various celebrities. Given Hoover's almost obsessive condemnation of illicit sexual activities of public figures, as well as the quick disciplining of any agents indiscreet enough to get caught in similar affairs, some visitors were surprised at the display of female nudity in Hoover's house. There were numerous pieces of such sculpture, paintings, and even the celebrated nude photo of Marilyn Monroe. Since Hoover has never been known to have had any romantic relationship with a woman, his own sex life has long been a subject of rumour, especially within the Bureau. The talk has been fed by his close friendship with his FBI associate for 44 years, Clyde Tolson. The two dined and lunched together every day, went to racetracks together on Saturdays, kept each other company on every business or pleasure trip. Those who knew both men well feel certain that the relationship was not a sexual one. 
To support this feeling, they argue that Hoover was too openly scornful of gay people to have been one himself, which does not necessarily follow. At any rate, according to this view, the FBI consumed his passions totally, and he seems to have been asexual. Another bachelor and lifelong FBI career man, Tolson never infringed on the boss's limelight, but could snap out orders to subordinates with all of Hoover's authority and bite. Hoover left most of his estate to Tolson, who auctioned off much of it before his own death last spring. It seems clear that Hoover was quite a miser. For some twenty years, he and Tolson dined every night at Harvey's, a top-flight Washington restaurant owned by a Hoover friend. He never received a cheque, but would leave a tip in cash. When the restaurant was sold, the two men continued dining at their reserve table, but quit when the new owner began sending Hoover a monthly bill. Hoover, moreover, pocketed money from the best-selling book about US communism, Masters of Deceit, even though it was written under his byline by FBI agents working on government time. On most every conceivable occasion, Tolson solicited gifts among top personnel for the director. A record was kept of those foolish enough to fail to give. Hoover set up a tax-exempt charitable foundation to help support Freedom's Foundation, which gave at least two $5,000 personal achievement awards to Hoover. What sort of man was Hoover? He was a charmer, concedes one harsh critic, former associate FBI director William Sullivan in a Hoover biography. The Director by Ovid de Maris. He was a brilliant chameleon, but he was also an expert conman. That makes intelligence of a certain kind, an astuteness, a shrewdness. He never read anything that would broaden his mind or give depth to his thinking. I never knew him to have an intellectual or educated friend. Neither did Tolson. They lived in their own strange little world. Sullivan told Time that Hoover was so intrigued by stories about expanding lifespans through medical rejuvenation that he ordered FBI officials in Switzerland to send him reports about a Swiss physician's formula for prolonging life. Added Sullivan, he was a man with the ability to continue 33 fights at the same time, without slackening his pace or confusing one fight with another. He was always fighting with other government officials with the immigration people, with the customs agency, with anyone who criticised him. The fights seemed to stimulate him. Hoover and Tolson's world, of course, embraced the FBI and, from the inside looking out, it was a unique atmosphere. There is little doubt that Hoover built an organisation of competent, efficient, incorruptible investigators. But he also created a Byzantine bureaucracy in which agents lived in states of recurring terror. Hoover had so many rules of personal behaviour and so many specific procedures for conducting investigations that in the rough world of dealing with crime, no agent could adhere to all of them. This bred a deep cynicism throughout the FBI and encouraged agents to find ways of breaking rules without getting caught. At the same time, agents spied on other agents. Even stenographers were encouraged to report violations anonymously if they wished. Supervisors tried to blame subordinates for violations. There was no appeal when Hoover decided that an agent should be demoted, exiled to an undesirable post, or summarily fired. The director's favorite punishment posts were Butte, Mont, Oklahoma City, and, surprisingly, New Orleans. Hoover thought the Louisiana climate was miserable, but many an agent gratefully accepted such punishment. The result was an arcane world in which the Washington headquarters, where Hoover reigned so autocratically, was grandiosely referred to in internal FBI memos as the seat of government, SOG. Unofficially, the inspectors, whose nasty job was to check on procedural violations, were called goons. What they were seeking were subs, shorthand for substantial violations, of either the three-volume manual of instructions detailing how to pursue some 180 kinds of investigations, or of the thick manual of rules and regulations, setting standards of personal conduct. Each lowly special agent in the field reported to an equally frightened assistant special agent in charge, ASAC, and to the regional bureau boss, the special agent in charge, 
SAC. A SAC dreaded the day when he would hear, in an echo of Mafia lingo, that there was a contract out for him from Hoover's office. Then he knew the goons would promptly arrive to pore over every record of his bureau's work. Inevitably, they would find cause for punishment, one of the mildest of which was to order the SAC to hit the bricks, a transfer from running a bureau to being an agent again. Some agents were convinced that Hoover had diabolically designed his rules to give him justification for firing anyone at any time. Hoover was especially finicky about the appearance of agents, white shirts and dark ties, jackets on in the office, hair short. There were strict rules about the use of official cars, never drive them home overnight, no accidents, not even fender benders. A late expense account could mean punishment. Unmarried agents were sometimes fired for sharing a hotel room with a woman. A SAC was once saved from demotion when aides to an inspector from Washington made passes at women in his office. The SAC, target of the investigation, reported the indiscretions to SOG, and the inspector was censured instead. The evasions to skirt the rules were ingenious. To beat the anti-obesity program, one agent put heavy weights in his pockets before stepping on the scales. In each successive weigh-in, he put in less metal. His superiors were impressed by such heroic efforts to reduce weight. No agent, of course, dared point out that Hoover looked a bit fleshy himself. A glimpse into this bizarre life is offered by Joseph L. Schott, a retired 23-year veteran of FBI service, in his recent book, No Left Turns. The title stems from the fact that Hoover's limousine was once struck by another car while making a left turn. Agents thereafter were ordered to plan routes for Hoover so that his car rarely had to make a left turn. Schott claims that everyone around Hoover was too terrified to ask the boss what he meant by some of his impulsive comments. Thus, Schott reports, Hoover concluded one meeting of high FBI officials by saying, I have been looking over the supervisors at the seat of government. A lot of them are clods. Get rid of them. Instead of asking Hoover whom he had in mind, the officials formed a committee. Others called it the Clod Squad. They managed to find one or two supervisors fed up enough with Washington to accept a transfer and thus appease Hoover. Similarly, according to Schott, after a line of new agents just out of the FBI's academy at Quantico, VA, filed past Hoover for the routine welcome, J. Edgar barked, One of them is a pinhead. Get rid of him. Hoover underlings secretly opened the recruits' lockers and measured every hat, hats were mandatory, to find the man Hoover meant. When they discovered three tied for smallest size, all three were dismissed. The sycophants around Hoover puzzled over his cryptic notes, always in blue ink, on orders and personnel files. The notes were known as Blue Gems. There was consternation when the director wrote on one agent's personnel record, Give this man what he deserves. The solution. The agent was given both a letter of censure and a transfer to a post he was seeking. No whim of the director's was too insignificant to be ignored. Hoover once stayed at the home of a wealthy manufacturer of bathroom fixtures and liked the fancy commodes in the guest rooms. The host sent one to Hoover's house. But according to former agent Schott, Hoover complained that it was too high. Agents duly measured the one at the manufacturer's home and the new one in Hoover's home. Sure enough, Hoover's was two inches higher. A squad of agents worked through a weekend with a plumber to lower the fixture. Though few, if any, agents were fond of Hoover's nitpicking regulations, some found merit in his harsh, disciplinary ways. He imbued us with a spirit of belonging to something above the other agencies, said Peter Kotsos, a former agent. He built an esprit, and we lived in the knowledge that if you didn't abide by the rules, you got out. Although Hoover's capriciousness took a heavy personal toll, he did indeed, single-handed, Take a corrupt and dismal organization and pound it into an impressive outfit. That part of the Hoover legend remains intact. Hoover's early history is familiar. Born in Washington on New Year's Day, 1895, he was a son of a civil service worker, president by terrain, Sunday school teacher as a teenager. 
He had law degrees from George Washington University by studying night classes, while a clerk at the Library of Congress by day. Joined Justice Department at 22, first major assignment, 1917, with War Emergency Division, dealing with enemy aliens, transferred to the Bureau of Investigation at age 24 by Attorney General Mitchell Palmer, helped lead the Palmer Raids, dragnet arrests that swept up hundreds of Russians and radicals across the nation. Named Assistant Director of the Bureau in 1921, Director in 1924 at age 29. The FBI achieved its fame after the On It Me, recalls a former agent. But we didn't have enough evidence to show there was one communist in the State Department, let alone the 57 McCarthy was claiming. During the 40s, Hoover was reluctant to move against organized crime. Some FBI agents think they know why. They tell stories of Hoover sometimes traveling to Manhattan to meet one of the Mafia's top figures, Frank Costello. The two would meet in Central Park. Costello convinced Hoover that there was no organized Mafia, merely a loose collection of independent racketeers. Some agents figure that Hoover also picked up some choice incidental tips from gambler Costello on the director's passionately pursued avocation laying two-dollar bets on the horses. Hoover did not get cracking on the mob until Attorney General Robert Kennedy insisted that he do so in 1961. By infiltrating the Ku Klux Klan, the FBI was able to act swiftly in the early 60s to solve several murders of civil rights workers in the South. But as King charged, the Bureau did little about enforcing civil rights laws that did not involve such sensational crimes. One reason, the FBI was concentrating on catching auto thieves and fugitives to keep its Southern Bureau's arrest and recovery statistics on Hoover's mandated upward curves. It was King's criticism that led Hoover to call him the most notorious liar in the US and to launch an ugly vendetta against him. Hoover ordered one tape from a bugged Miami hotel room where King had been staying sent anonymously to King's wife. The FBI sent word of King's reported sexual activities to the Pope, trying to convince the pontiff not to receive him. One of Hoover's men recalls discussing with the director and another aide the FBI's crusade against King. The aide claimed that the black leader had not only associated with communists, but that there was a sexual matter. King was gay man. No, no, said the aide. King isn't queer. Then what's the big problem? the man asked. King isn't the only married guy who sleeps with other women, replied the aide as Hoover nodded agreement. He sleeps with white women. Sex seemed often on Hoover's mind. Shortly after the killing or wounding of 15 students by Ohio National Guardsmen at Kent State in 1970, top-ranking officials of the Justice Department held a meeting to discuss a federal probe. At its end, Hoover took over and talked about only one topic, his belief that one of the co-ed victims had been sexually promiscuous. Recalled one official, when Hoover finally ran down, no one else said a word. We all just got up and walked silently out of the room. We were all embarrassed. As Hoover became a public bother, why didn't presidents try to retire him? Johnson made one weak effort. In 1967, he told his favorite Secret Service agent, Rufus Youngblood, to go to FBI headquarters and take over. Youngblood wandered around the Bureau for several days. Hoover ignored him. LBJ changed his mind. Nixon once screwed up the courage to edge Hoover out. He summoned the director to breakfast in 1971 to offer him a special job as a consultant on crime with an office close to Nixon's own. Hoover, alerted, launched into a rapid-fire monologue all through the 45-minute breakfast, never letting the sensitive subject arise. Nixon, as a former aide put it, simply chickened out. After one bitter Hoover diatribe at a Justice Department meeting, Assistant Attorney General Ruckelshaus called Attorney General John Mitchell aside. We've got to get rid of that guy, Ruckelshaus pleaded. He's getting worse all the time, replied the laconic Mitchell. You're right. Tell you what. I must leave town later today, so I'm appointing you acting attorney general. 
you fire him. No braver, the Kennedys earlier had let the word out that if Jack had been re-elected in 1964, they would have retired Hoover when he reached his 70th birthday, Jan 1, 1965. Ethel Kennedy, spotting an FBI suggestion box at a Justice Department party, had even mischievously slipped in a note that Hoover ought to be replaced by the sheriff of Los Angeles County. The director was not amused. Some Washington veterans claim no president could have fired Hoover because he held so much damaging information on all of them. Others scoffed at the extortion notion, contending that Hoover was so popular, his ratings often were 90% or higher, that dismissing him would have been a grave political risk. A disturbing question is why Hoover for so long was able to still any effective criticism. Didn't journalists know what kind of dirty tactics Hoover was employing? A few newsmen Jack Anderson, Fred Cook, Tom Wicker, Jack Nelson, picked up and printed some facets of the dark side of Hoover. A few groups, Black Panthers, the Congress of Racial Equality, Students for a Democratic Society, Socialist Workers' Party, and Minutemen, had long been complaining, rightly as it turned out, about FBI harassment. But mostly, no one was listening. Even as late as 1973, most editors laughed when Norman Mailer threw a 50th birthday party for himself at Manhattan's Four Seasons restaurant and urged the creation of Democratic Secret Police to keep tabs on the bureaucratic secret police the FBI and CIA. As in all of Hoover's battles with various opponents, he was exceptionally adroit in managing the press. Long before Nixon, the FBI had its own enemies list of reporters and publications that seemed unfriendly and should be shunned on all inquiries, no matter how trivial. Anyone printing positive news about the FBI, on the other hand, might be favoured with some of the FBI's rare handouts of information on major stories. For a newsman, which was more readily productive than trying to interest an editor in some undocumented expose of FBI practices based on nervous, anonymous sources. The Los Angeles Times' Jack Nelson tried anyway. Soon his office was swirling with rumours that he was a drunk, and his boss got a letter from Hoover gently suggesting that Nelson be fired. Has all that changed now that the director is gone? Some agents wonder. The new boss, Clarence Kelly, is a veteran and well-regarded lifelong police official. But Kelly is an outsider. He was chief of police in Kansas City, Montana, and the FBI is still a closed corporation. The top officials under Kelly, in charge of the day-by-day -day supervision of the agency, are Hoover-trained loyalists. They are Associate Director Nicholas Callahan and Assistant Deputy Director James Adams. Both are also protégés of John Moore, a retired Hoover aide still in touch with the Bureau, close enough, some agents believe, that he in effect calls key signals. Yet conditions are changing. Among the Bureau's 8,000 agents, there are now 103 black people. Job applications still far exceed openings. Kelly does talk to his top agents around the country, and in the field, if not in Washington morale, is holding up Many old petty rules have been relaxed. There is less emphasis on statistical achievements, stolen car arrests and other easy shots, and more on white-collar crime, organised crime and other cases that rarely fatten the win column. With all the public pressure and new scrutiny, any repeat of the old political abuses of civil rights seems unlikely. Mostly, it is a rocky time of buffeting for the Bureau. The ship, in a sense, is dead in the water, awaiting new orders on new courses, which may well be set by Congress. Some may long nostalgically for the old man, but along the way, Hoover clearly lost that inner compass that had served the Bureau so well for so many years. The freewheeling days of J. Edgar Hoover are over. Now Congress and the executive branch must find ways to limit the FBI's activities and prevent future abuses of its vast powers. Last week, several experts gave their recommendations to Democrat Frank Church's Senate Intelligence Committee. The proposals fell into four categories. A legislative charter. Both critics and supporters of the FBI agreed that Congress should enact legislation, spelling out what the FBI can and cannot do. 
particularly in keeping watch on violence-prone dissidents and potential subversives, said FBI Director Clarence Kelly. I would welcome any guidelines. Democratic Senator Walter Mondale of Minnesota argued that the FBI should be allowed to put citizens under surveillance or infiltrate activist groups only when the Bureau has unmistakable evidence that federal laws have been or are about to be violated. Kelly's retort, the FBI must sometimes infiltrate groups to learn whether our laws are about to be broken, he said. As a practical matter, the line between work and regular criminal intelligence investigations is often difficult to describe. What begins as an intelligence investigation may well end in arrest and of the subject. William Ruckelshaus, a former Deputy Attorney General and former Acting FBI Director, suggested a compromise. He urged that Congress spell out the FBI's authority to investigate I individuals or groups who may through violence present a threat to other individuals or groups. But Ruckelshaus would have Congress give the Attorney General the power to set the guidelines on how the FBI would use its authority. Administrative Curbs Since assuming office in February, Attorney General Edward Levi has taken several steps to leash the FBI. For one thing, he has required that White House requests for FBI action be made in writing and through official channels. He also has instructed Kelly to report to him all improper requests, in his two and a half years as director, said Kelly. There have not been any. Last week Levi told the Senate committee that his department is drafting an order that would allow the FBI to investigate domestic dissidents only if there is a likelihood that they participate in violent and illegal activities. The directive would also prohibit the FBI from trying to discredit or disrupt the organizations unless there was no other way to eliminate an immediate risk to human life. Under the draft guidelines, the FBI would have to inform the Attorney General of all domestic security probes. In turn, he would be required to halt any investigation that failed to meet the written standards. Levi's proposed guidelines on domestic surveillance did not satisfy many of the committee members. Said Mondale, Guidelines written by the executive branch can be rewritten by the executive branch, by those who follow you. They will mean absolutely nothing in the face of a willful president or a willful attorney general. Thus, the committee will recommend that the standards be written into law. Former Attorney General Ramsey Clark, in fact, urged that specific statutes should authorize, prohibit, or regulate every investigative and enforcement method. Government agents should not have to guess what is permitted. Both committee members and Justice Department officials favor requiring court approval of wiretaps in domestic security. Such approval is now a federal requirement cases, only in criminal cases. Congressional oversight. Levi announced that an Office of Professional Responsibility was being set up within the Justice Department to watchdog all the agency's employees, including those of the FBI. The witnesses and the senators agreed that Congress should go a step farther and set up its own committee to oversee the FBI. Ruckelshaus urged that such a committee be privy to all information. The FBI has, relating to any specific investigation, and operate as openly as possible. The committee's job would be to see that any new law was honoured, demand the names of groups being infiltrated, oversee the use of bugs, wiretaps and informants, monitor FBI relations with the Attorney General, and judge the propriety of orders from the White House. Kelly was all for an oversight committee. Congress must assume a continuing role, not in the initial decision-making process, but in the review of our performance, he said. He added, I think that I can discuss everything but the identity of informants with an oversight committee. Limited tenure. The committee will adopt the recommendation of several witnesses that Congress set a limit to an FBI director's term. Recalling Hoover's 48-year tenure, Ruckelshaus urged that a director be restricted to eight or nine years. Clark recommended four years, starting at the midpoint of a presidential term to ease the danger of presidents and directors becoming too cosy. In fact, the Senate voted last spring
to limit the director's term to 10 years. A bill setting a 15-year limit is now before the House Judiciary Committee, which will not act until all the investigations of the FBI are completed in early 1976. The legacy of J. Edgar Hoover and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, is a complex narrative of both notable accomplishments and troubling controversies. While the FBI gained fame for its involvement in solving high-profile cases, such as the Lindbergh kidnapping and the pursuit of notorious criminals during the early 30s, it was also characterized by questionable practices, extensive authority, and Hoover's extended tenure in power, which lasted nearly five decades. Hoover's leadership witnessed several genuine law enforcement achievements, including the agency's role in Wartim espionage and the pursuit of organized crime figures. However, it was equally marked by Hoover's relentless targeting of political adversaries, civil rights leaders, and perceived subversive elements within society. His willingness to employ unethical tactics, such as surveillance, harassment, and attempts to discredit public figures, most notably Martin Luther King Jr., raised serious concerns about the boundary between law enforcement and civil liberties. The FBI's evolution under Hoover's guidance from a fledgling agency to a potent and influential force in American society was marked by both successes and abuses. The challenges of ensuring oversight and accountability persisted even after Hoover's departure. The FBI continues to grapple with these issues as it adapts to changing leadership and contemporary challenges. Reflecting on this history underscores the importance of the lessons learned from the Hoover era. Recommendations for legislative oversight, well-defined guidelines, and limitations on leadership terms are crucial in ensuring that the FBI operates within the bounds of the law and upholds civil liberties and justice for all. In today's dynamic law enforcement landscape, the FBI stands at a critical juncture, tasked with striking a balance between its role as a guardian of the nation and its responsibility to safeguard the rights and freedoms of its citizens. The story of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI serves as a stark reminder of the ongoing need for vigilance, transparency and accountability in the pursuit of justice. In conclusion, the legacy of J. Edgar Hoover and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, is one of complexity and controversy. While the FBI achieved fame for its role in solving high-profile cases like the Lindbergh kidnapping and the pursuit of notorious criminals, it was also marked by questionable practices, overreach, and Hoover's iron grip on power for nearly five decades. Hoover's tenure saw moments of genuine law enforcement success, including wartime efforts against spies and saboteurs and the pursuit of organized crime figures. However, it was marred by his obsession with targeting political opponents, civil rights leaders, and those he deemed subversive. Hoover's willingness to employ unethical tactics, such as surveillance, harassment, and attempts to discredit public figures, including Martin Luther King Jr., raises troubling questions about the balance between law enforcement and civil liberties. The story of the FBI's transformation under Hoover's leadership, from a fledgling agency to a powerful and influential force in American society, is a tale of both triumphs and abuses. The challenges of oversight and accountability persist, even after Hoover's departure, as the FBI navigates new leadership and strives to adapt to changing times. As we reflect on this history, the lessons learned from Hoover's era are essential for shaping the FBI's future. With recommendations for legislative oversight, clear guidelines, and limits on leadership tenure, there is a renewed effort to ensure that the FBI operates within the boundaries of the law and respects the principles of civil liberties and justice for all. In the evolving landscape of law enforcement, the FBI stands at a crossroads facing the critical task of balancing its role as a protector of the nation with its responsibility to safeguard the rights and freedoms of its citizens. The story of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI serves as a reminder of the ongoing need for vigilance, transparency and accountability in the pursuit of justice.
The relationship between the FBI and organized crime, especially under J. Edgar Hoover, is a tale of complexity, power struggles, and societal challenges. Hoover, who served multiple presidents, may have started his tenure with noble intentions. Yet the intoxication of power and his possible concealed homosexuality in a less accepting era added layers to his leadership. Hoover's era was marked by figures like Frank Costello, known as honorable men of their word in contrast to the stereotypes of mobsters. These mobsters, with their savvy lawyers, skillfully navigated the legal landscape to operate under the FBI's radar, ensuring their crimes remained a state matter, away from federal scrutiny. This strategy was effective largely because of the widespread corruption among state police, senators and politicians, leaving Hoover with limited options as federal laws were seldom broken. Hoover's understanding of the mob's control over gambling and his participation in it through betting on horse races with high odds, is another intriguing aspect. These bets, while not making him rich, allowed him to maintain a comfortable lifestyle. This dynamic underscored the mob's influence, extending to controlling politicians, senators and judges, who in turn were crucial for Hoover in securing funding and legal support for the FBI's operations against corruption. However, these same figures would turn against Hoover if he threatened their benefactors in organized crime. The narrative extends beyond the FBI, revealing that various intelligence and military organizations also had dealings with organized crime during the 50s, including the Central Intelligence Agency. This indicates a broader acceptance of the Mafia's power to the extent that even the FBI, under Hoover, hesitated to confront them directly. Today, the influence once wielded by the Mafia seems mirrored in the operations of major corporations, which often act with impunity, reminiscent of the modern-day mafia. This shift suggests that the power dynamics the FBI once navigated with organized crime have not disappeared, but transformed, with the agency now facing challenges in regulating these new titans of industry. Frank Costello was pivotal in New York's organized crime, dealing with the FBI's corruption there, However, in the South, Carlos Marcello and Santo Traficante were the powerhouses. According to the article, J. Edgar Hoover used Louisiana as a place to send agents he wanted to punish due to its harsh weather conditions. This led to an unexpected outcome, where a group of disgruntled FBI agents looking to regain Hoover's favor found themselves at the mercy of Carlos Marcello, one of America's most influential mob bosses. Marcello saw an opportunity in these desperate agents. He provided them with low-level criminals and even framed innocent people, including civil rights workers, to create the illusion of success. This scheme helped these agents appear competent and effective in their roles, inadvertently placing the FBI's operations in Louisiana under Marcello's influence. This control extended deep into the 60s, with FBI agents like Regis Kennedy remaining under Marcello's sway into the 70s. Marcello's manipulation showcases the extent of organized crime's reach into law enforcement, revealing a complex web of corruption and desperation within the FBI's ranks.